What are you doing? A woman asked of the two travelers. Fixing stone soup. All you need is a little water and some stones, one replied. Of course, it would be better if we just had a bit of potatoes, said the other. I have some, she said, and going off, shortly returned with them. Others passed and stopped to question the strangers. Each time the two travelers explained, and each time the townspeople volunteered to provide the necessary ingredient. At the end of the day, every imaginable vegetable, herb, and spice had been added to the pot. That night, the two travelers fed the whole town on the most delicious soup anyone had ever tasted. We gather here together in this familiar place, hungering for mystery and miracles. But who is the stranger in our midst, the one who calls to us? The stranger tells of loaves and fishes, of love and living water, of things lost and found. Who is this stranger in our midst? Every 
We fill our lives with the fear of scarcity, assuming there is not enough money, time, patience, or love. We turn away when a stranger asks for nourishment, claiming there isn't even enough for ourselves. Forgive us when we doubt your abundance and ignore the possibilities in what we have been given. We often sit with arms crossed and fists clenched, crying out that you have turned away and left us empty-handed. Forgive us when we reject your abundance and neglect the possibilities in what we have been given. We easily give thanks for the good things in life, turning away from those which lead us to deeper community or second-guessing blessings as too good to be true. Open our eyes to the wonders that surround us. Help us surrender to the loving embrace that enfolds us. Take comfort. We and the whole world with us are always embraced in Christ's love. In Christ, there is always enough. When Jesus heard about John, he withdrew in a boat to a deserted place by himself. When the crowds learned this, they followed him on foot from the cities. When Jesus arrived and saw a large crowd, he had compassion for them and healed those who were sick. That evening, his disciples came and said to him, This is an isolated place, and it's getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said to them, There's no need to send them away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here except five loaves of bread and two fish. He said, Bring them here to me. He ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. He took the five loaves of bread and the two fish, looked up to heaven, blessed them, and broke the loaves apart and gave them to his disciples. Then the disciples gave them to the crowds. Everyone ate until they were full, and they filled twelve baskets with the leftovers. About five thousand men, plus women and children, had eaten. Warren Carter is a seminary professor from New Zealand who specializes in the Book of Matthew and the Greek New Testament, now living in Oklahoma and teaching at Phillips Theological Seminary. He's the author of five books on Matthew alone. Carter suggests three contexts to help us more clearly understand the significance of Jesus' recorded actions involving abundant food. We know that Jesus turns to a vision of food abundance to talk about the kingdom of God and God's desire to care for God's people and our mandate to care for each other. Remember that right after today's gospel story, in the 15th chapter of Matthew, Jesus once again feeds the crowds. Here's the first thing to understand about the context of this gospel story. The world of the first century Roman Empire was marked by significant inequalities concerning food access. Many people knew food insecurity and struggled on a daily and seasonal basis for adequate food and nutrition. The Roman Empire was very hierarchical in its social structure with a small group of ruling elites who enjoyed abundant variety and good food quality. But most of the population lived around, at, or below subsistence level with inadequate nutrition. The petition in the Lord's Prayer that God will supply daily bread reflects this situation of daily struggle. Give us this day our daily bread. Or in the common English translation, give us the bread we need for today. And tomorrow, we will ask you again. Which is in sharp contrast to the way that we might go about securing food for our families. God, give me a pantry that looks like a Costco store so that I don't have to worry about depending on anyone except myself. <laughs> With our full pantries and our freezers up and running, depending on God each day is kind of optional. We can think more about that as we go along. Many people in our own neighborhoods and community face a daily struggle. We easily forget about and fail to notice this struggle that's going on around us. 
from Feeding America West Michigan, which covers the Upper Peninsula in their territory, we learned that more than 290,000 people in West Michigan and the Upper Peninsula are food insecure, meaning they don't have consistent access to enough food for an active, healthy life. Food insecurity exists for a variety of reasons, and anyone can experience a bout of it. The neighbors served by Feeding America West Michigan's network are constantly changing as people fall in or out of need. But children, seniors, and hardworking parents are always among those served. There's an important acronym for studying this data, and the acronym is ALICE, Asset Limited Income Constrained Employed Persons. It represents the growing number of families who are unable to afford the basics of housing, childcare, food, transportation, health care, and technology. The second context piece identified by Dr. Carter is to remind us that the biblical tradition explicitly identifies God's will that hungry people be fed. Here are some examples. God provides food for the wilderness generation in Exodus. Matthew's scene is set in a deserted place or a wilderness place. This setting evokes the Exodus story and God's feeding of the wilderness generation. Ezekiel condemns in Israel's leaders or shepherds for failing to lead the sheep or the people. The prophet Isaiah declares God's will that people share your bread with the hungry. Matthew's Jesus endorses the merciful practice of almsgiving that redistributes resources to those in need. He defends the practice of procuring food as a way of honoring the Sabbath. He also declares that the nations will be judged in part on whether they have provided food for the hungry. The third context piece is this. Traditions concerned with the establishment of God's kingdom in all its fullness depict this coming age in terms of abundant food and feasting for all. Ezekiel casts a vision about a time when the trees of the field shall yield their fruit and the earth shall yield its increase. They shall be secure on their soil. When I break the bars of their yoke and save them from the hands of those who enslave them, I will provide for them a splendid vegetation so that they shall no more be consumed with hunger in the land. Jesus' action highlights and confronts this injustice of the Roman world with an action that enacts God's will to feed hungry people. And that anticipates the coming age in which God will supply abundant food. Crowds join Jesus in this deserted place. The disciples approach and stating the obvious about it being a deserted place, instruct Jesus to send the crowds away to the villages to buy food. They produce the five loaves and two fish, but there's no little boy in the story in Matthew, you might notice. Jesus takes control and hosts the meal. He blesses the food and gives it to the disciples to distribute to the crowd. This language of taking loaves, blessed, broke, and giving to the disciples appears in the Last Supper scene later in chapter 26. But this is not a Last Supper. There's no cup, first of all. But the two are linked by the use of food and the dispersal of divine blessing. Jesus enacts God's will that hungry people be fed. He anticipates the abundant blessing of good food described by Ezekiel and Isaiah in the time when God's kingdom is established in full. We read all eight and were filled. The scene is of a life-giving feast embodying the gracious abundance of God. When will this age of secure and nutritional food supply come? And what role do we have as members of the household of God in seeing God's vision of abundance through for all? Let's take another look at our story, Stone Soup. In John Muth's retelling of this beloved folk tale of abundance for all, it goes like this. A brave little girl who had been watching came to them. What are you doing? She asks. We're gathering twigs, said Locke. We are making a fire, said Hawk. 
We are making stone soup and we need three round smooth stones, said Sue. Notice that the little girl didn't point out what a ridiculous idea this was. She didn't say, I've never heard of this before. Surely it won't work. She didn't say, why can't people just take care of themselves like I do? She didn't say, we should ask for permission or form a committee or create a three-year visioning document. Here's what happens. The little girl helped the monks look around the courtyard until they found just the right stones. Then they put them in the water to cook. These stones will make excellent soup, but this very small pot won't make much, I'm afraid. My mother has a bigger pot, said the girl. Of course, the girl goes home to get the big pot from her mother, which has to be rolled on its side through the streets of the village. People get curious and come to see what on earth is going on. Are the monks ticketed for trespassing, not to mention fire building, and run out of town? No, in the simple not to mention fictional days of this tale. The first written version seems to be from France in about 1720, and traceable in England and America in the early 1800s. In version after version, the travelers are treated with curiosity and respect. They possess a wisdom that borders on the mystical, and abundance is what's present. Even when we, like the villagers, going about our day-to-day -day lives don't see it, who knows who may travel through and point out to us that this abundance was here all along. Soup, bread, and fish. Sharing what we have isn't a politeness or even a kindness. It isn't a curiosity or a heroic achievement. It's our calling. We are here, followers of Jesus and members of the household of God in our time and place, and we can clearly see the vision for abundance that is given over and over again throughout scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. Give all of us this day our daily bread. Feed my lambs. Everyone is welcome at the table. The promise of God's abundance is alive among us. Amen. We hope you're enjoying Pod Church. Please take a moment to subscribe to our channel and be notified each time there's a new video. Be sure to check out our Facebook page for up-to-date information as well as our weekly newsletter. Feel free to say hello on Facebook Messenger or use our email address and let us know how you're enjoying Pod Church. Trust and heed the words of the stranger. Nourish the abundance of community that feeds our lives. Savor all that God has provided and know that whatever is needed will be given. Pod Church is the weekly online worship of Marquette Hope, a United Methodist faith community located in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Find us at facebook.com slash mqthope, mqthope.com, and on YouTube.